dominated by men. No, it's what not. It's not. You, the market is dominated by women. In the first installment of this series, I described how Kathy Newman has been using her threat narrative framing to dominate her interview with Professor Peterson. <laughs> interview. More like Inquisition. Kathy Newman's strategy has been to inflate the potential danger of men and exaggerate the vulnerability of women. In particular, she's been attempting to dominate Professor Peterson, your identity, in the eyes of the audience by making you out to be somehow harmful to women. In addition, Kathy Newman has successfully framed the debate so that it's an argument over women's vulnerabilities, namely women being victim of the wage gap. This means that she, all she has to do is spin out enough uncertainty over the facts and anyone watching who doesn't already trust you or operate in the dimension of reason will default to assuming women are victims of the wage gap. That's all she has to do is fart out enough confusion and people in the emotional dimension will be unable to grasp the counter argument to the wage gap and default to the safe position, which is assuming it exists and is due to discrimination against women. And most people are going to be encountering this debate in the emotional dimension because that's how most people navigate their world. Emotions are just shortcuts that we've developed based on patterns and knowledge that we trust. Without emotions, we can't make a decision. For example, a decision on who to trust. So what they're going to do is look for body language, tone of voice, reactions, and up to 18 minutes and 39 seconds, up to 18 minutes and 39 seconds in, you've been giving off confusing, contradictory, and defensive signals. In the face of Kathy Newman's interrogation, you've appeared understandably defensive. Your body language has been subdued. Your gaze averted. That last point I noticed quite a bit. You rarely looked directly at Kathy Newman as you responded to her. But then, at 18 minutes and 39 seconds, you changed everything. The market sets the damn game. It's like... And the market is dominated by men. No, it's not. It's not. You. The market is dominated by women. They make 80% of the consumer decisions. That's not the case what? at all. This sudden assertiveness, edging into anger, the I will brook no dissent tone of voice, the physical gesture, the first time in this interview, in which you are pointing directly at Kathy. And add to that, you're now looking directly at her. Anger is an honest emotion. I think that's why we're often afraid of men's anger, not because of the physical threat. It's honest and it's forthright. And now that we've seen you show it, everyone engaging on this on an emotional level will now look back and say, oh, he wasn't defensive before, he was holding back. Now let's look at what you're saying. Dominated by men. No, it's what not, it's you? not. The market is dominated by women. They make 80% of the consumer decision. You've switched the debate frame from the wage gap to the spending gap. You've picked up a men's rights talking point about women's greater spending power in society, and you're using this to completely reframe this debate. Look at Kathy's response. About people who stay at home looking after children. She looks and sounds like a spanked child. It's because you've blown her threat narrative right out of the water. You've maneuvered her into a frame in which even if she creates uncertainty, you don't lose. You've put her on the defensive, trying to answer for women's greater spending power, something that she's not used to. Now, even if you fail to prove the point or Kathy Newman farts out some more confusion, I'm fired. She won't actually win in terms of the threat narrative she's trying to spin. If she creates uncertainty about women's greater power, that doesn't mean women are victims. It means they may not have a power that men also don't have. The spending gap argument is simple and devastating. There have been many groups of people throughout history who have controlled more resources than they created. People who control more resources than they create are not oppressed. You're now winning, not just in the rational dimension,
but the emotional dimension. And you're putting a, a good damn fight in the threat narrative dimension by successfully countering Kathy Newman's attempt to frame women as victims and instead substituting your own frame as women as powerful, all with a men's rights talking point. And you don't stop there. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. People in the rational dimension will look at this and see the ethical and logical contradictions she's making and that you're pointing them out. But again, your response exists in more than just the rational dimension. It exists simultaneously in both the emotional and threat narrative dominance dimensions as well. You're turning her language around on her. You're putting her on the defensive, not just answering for women's greater power, but answering for her greater power and aggression in this interview directed at you. Why should you have the right to do that? The language you just used is the language of controlling someone's identity. In this case, con you controlling Kathy Newman's. What you've done is to say you have the right to judge her her morality by referencing your vulnerability to her actions and her choices. It's why she's just flummoxed. She's not even blinking in shock or looking like a spanked child. She's just stopped working. She's like blah, 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 blah. I'm just trying I'm just trying to work that out. I mean Ha, gotcha. You have got me. Remember, in the threat narrative dimension, the way you establish dominance is by exaggerating your vulnerability. In this case, you didn't exaggerate anything. You were just being honest. You were genuinely made uncomfortable by her behavior and by inflating your target's harm. Again, you were just being honest about her making you uncomfortable. You didn't inflate her the harm she did to you. But the end result is that you neutralized her threat narrative. You have now won in every dimension, rational, emotional, and dominance. You said in interviews about this interview, <laughs> interviews about the interview, that this was the moment you felt you were talking with an actual human being. It's because in neutralizing your threat narrative, you forced her to start operating in the emotional and rational dimensions again. You cut off the weight and she bobbed back up. And she saw you for the first time as a human being, not a servant that needed to be put in his place, a human being. When I put out one of my most downvoted videos in this channel, his channel's history, this is exactly what I was talking about. The video is called Professor Peterson, The Problem Isn't Cultural Marxism. And a lot of your fans really didn't like it. In it, I described the situation of our society as Penelope gone mad, Penelope from Odys the Odyssey, and tearing apart her weaving because she sees Odysseus not as, a, not as her lost love returned to her, but as a threat. When I say Penelope is tearing apart her weaving, I mean women like Kathy Newman are tearing apart the basis of our society. They're tearing apart the emotional and rational aspects of language in order to turn it into a tool of dominance through threat narratives. And I'll talk about that more at a later date because I have a lot to say about the de-evolution of language. Deprogramming ev women, everyone. Yes, I'm getting to it eventually. In that video, I said... The only way to stop the Kathy Newmans of the world in their madness is for Odysseus to lift up a mirror and show Penelope what she's doing to him. That mirror is the experience of her actions and his vulnerability to those actions. To say, Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. That's what she did. You lifted up the mirror used her your vulnerabilities to reflect her actions back at her to make her take adult responsibility for your vulnerabilities as a man and for a moment kathy newman was made whole you have got me you have got me i'm trying to work that through my head yeah yeah it took a while it took a while it did. It this was the greatest victory ironically it was also a victory for kathy as much as she will try to resist acknowledging it you gave her a sense of self and individual moral worth and the promise of a truly adult identity based on making moral choices and having those moral choices respected as affecting others. 
In order for women to grow a sense of their individual existence, someone must be in position to judge their actions so they have something to achieve through those actions. This is what I've been saying all along. As difficult as men's issues and men's vulnerabilities are for men to look at, much less internalize, they are the tools that will cleanse the world of the threat narrative. People like Kathy Newman reduce themselves down to being handmaidens and mouthpieces for long-term misery in exchange for the pleasure of momentary dominance. That's Kathy Newman's life. I know that men's issues and men's vulnerabilities are the most difficult things to talk about in our society for this very reason. Men don't want to feel weak or small or incapable or useless, and I don't want to make them feel that way. But look at the reality. When you said, paraphrased, men aren't that powerful and you're hurting me to Kathy Newman, you weren't saying those things from a position of weakness, far from it. Unlike a lot of what you said throughout the first part of the interview, some of it said defensively, some conversationally, some conciliatorily. Unlike all of that, you said both of those statements with power and authority. And Kathy Newman responded to that power, your power, by being petulantly submissive and momentarily silenced by our own sudden insight. And the reason why you said both statements with power was because they gave you power. They gave you power to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kathy Newman's attempt to control your identity as a man. That's what I want for young men. I try to give young men these weapons, the shield of men's issues, the sword, the sword of their own vulnerabilities. And you've just demonstrated to all your young male followers how men's issues and their own vulnerabilities as men are both shield and sword against the Kathy Newmans of the world who try to dominate dominate their identity through a threat narrative. I'm aware of how difficult it is for men to pick up this sword and shield because they seem like the exact opposite of what they want or need. Because dominance in the threat narrative dimension is the opposite of how men assert dominance. Young men want to feel powerful and capable and men's issues don't give them that. They want to feel useful about and their own vulnerabilities are certainly not an expression of usefulness. The truth is that feminist theory with its emphasis on male power derived not from men's actions, but simply existing as a man in our society, in our patriarchy. Men don't have to do anything to have power in a patriarchy. They just have to have, they just have it by virtue of being a man. That myth of omnipotence is as seductive as a siren's song. It gives young men that stinging drug bright feeling of power and invulnerability. And that power for no effort whatsoever and all they have to do is feel shame and guilt and submit their identities to judgment afterward. But if young men can get past the discomfort of wielding men's issues as a shield and their vulnerabilities as a sword, if they can learn from and internalize exactly what you did, they can fight back against that seduction and the inevitable do dominance by the Kathy Newmans of their world, just like you did, and that's real power. I also know that men are worried that if they do embrace this sword and shield and use it somehow, they're going to stop wanting to help, stop wanting to serve, stop wanting to grow up, wanting to be a good mate to a woman. No. Kathy Newman's threat narrative, and all threat narratives, was never responsible for young men wanting to be useful. Being able to challenge it will not stop men wanting to be useful. No one makes young men want to be useful. Women's control over men's identities never made men serve, only changed who they serve, namely Kathy Newman and whatever ideological interests she thinks she represents. The desire to protect and provide is an instinct in men. Give me a hundred thousand years to apply alternative evolutionary pressures or the ability to genetically modify men and I might be able to get rid of men's desire to sacrifice for the benefit of women and society or men's willingness to engage in pro-social competition or men's instinctive response to women's tears. <laughs> that one's written right into your hormonal system. That's not going anywhere because it's innate to men. And that is the greatest, ugliest, narr threat narrative trick of all. Men are led to believe that the things they most cherish about themselves 
are actually forced out of them by threat narratives and other forms of social compulsion. So they identify with the person dominating their identity to their own ends when men should identify with themselves. You are the source of your desire to protect, to provide, to care, to save, to love, and to fight. No one else. Have you, Professor Peterson, ever thought about the implications that your lectures on growing up attract far more men than women? Not because men need to grow up more, necessarily, but because young men are more attracted to the message of growing up. That young men are more attracted to the message of sacrifice for others, of service to others, of strength in order to help others. When you say that your lectures on growing up attract more young men, and you also add that women seem to be attracted to your message that men have to grow up <laughs> to be good mates for them, not the message that young women need to grow the fuck up, I have to say that makes me wonder about young women or the, then their priorities or lack thereof. And then I look at Kathy Newman and I can't believe that a woman in her 40s, I presume she's in her 40s, would make a face like this. About people who stay at home looking after children. Because there's nothing uglier than an old infant. The only time she looked and acted like she had any kind of adult identity was after you blew her threat narrative out of the water and forced her into the position of facing adult responsibility for your rights and vulnerabilities as a man. You might argue that cultural Marxism is the proximal case cause for all of this, but I don't think it is. Marxist analysis of minority issues is just, they just buttress the central threat narrative, which is men oppressing women. Look at Kathy's response here. These are the areas of study dominated by the postmodern stroke neo-Marxist claim that Western culture in particular is an oppressive structure created by white men to dominate and exclude women. But then I want to put minorities to dominate and exclude. Okay, minorities. sure. She's revealing something. Something I think you may have also noticed because you emphasized it. She doesn't include minorities. Minorities Minority issues are useful, but not really what she cares about. They're an afterthought. Marxist analysis is similar, similarly useful, but it's not the point. When you successfully challenged her central threat narrative by asserting women's dominance over the marketplace, she shifted to a subordinate threat narrative, which is trans rights. The point isn't actually to advocate for trans issues, it's to use trans issues to dominate your identity by showing you as harmful to a recognized vulnerable group that she supposedly advocates for. It had nothing to do with economics, nothing to do with communism or capitalism, simply that you were a threat to a vulnerable group. It's just a tool of dominance. All of these identitarian politics have one goal, and it's not to bring about cultural Marxism. That's actually a symptom of the desire for complete smothering dominance. The goal is to control young men's identities. Young men are still our most productive class. Young men are still the reason why we have the prosperity and comfort we have. The reason why the petrodollar still has any value. They're what's left of America's riches. And I can hear you saying, but they're not giving young men a single word of encouragement, like you said here. It's so sad that so many of these men, you know, they've not had an encouraging bloody word, a real encouraging word in their entire life. This is something that really affected me when you said this, because I also weep over this, how little our society is willing to give young men, the very people it rests its prosperity on. But the truth is it's about momentary dominance and long-term despair. These people have hung everything under the, on this one young man, and if he lets go, they're fucked. That's all they're seeing right now. They're not seeing anything else. Just will happen. what will happen when that young man stops listening to them. So they get more and more controlling with less and less return. They both need and hate that young man. They don't want to get rid of him, but they can't. They want to get rid of him, but they can't because he's so responsive to their lies. And it's so short-sighted. They're now telling young men that if they succeed, it's because society took the success away from the people young men most want to serve, which is women. But if they succeed, if these young men succeed, it's because a society that hates women gave it to those young men 
not because they earned it. That goes beyond not giving any encouragement to active, active discouragement of the ugliest sort. And it's because they don't want to acknowledge a single good thing about men. The very thought that there might be something good about young men makes the bile rise to their back teeth. Why they can't say a single goddamn nice word is a conversation for another day. It's always been about dominating young men's identities using whatever tool is at hand. And you've just shown a whole bunch of young men how to slip their leash. That's why Channel 4 had to reestablish their threat narrative dominance with all that nonsense about 50,000 tweets or comments, all supposedly nasty harassment directed towards the delicate flower, Kathy Newman. <gasps> if you think it was your gotcha that shut down any further discourse and turned it toxic, it wasn't. You're taking too much responsibility. What made them flip their shit was you demonstrating how to get through to Kathy Newman for an instant by neutralizing the threat narrative. Do you remember her sneering with delight at the thought of all that supposed hostility she was getting on Twitter? You want to know why she's grinning like a dog chewing cat shit? Because that's how she got her threat narrative dominance back. That's how she and Channel 4 contained the damage you did with your public demonstration of how to neutralize their threat narrative. Their threat narrative, the one thing they base the entirety of their power to manipulate, to dominate, and to deceive on. Channel 4 couldn't keep you from dis demonstrating live how to slip the leash, but they could double down on their threat narrative towards your followers. This is the one thing I can genuinely criticize you for. Instead of continuing to successfully resist Kathy Newman's and Channel 4's threat narrative, you bought into it when it came to your followers. So I kind of played, let's say, knight on white horse. And so The Guardian yesterday published an astoundingly reprehensible article. About your book? No, about the Channel 4 interview. The Channel 4 people claim that Kathy has been targeted with threats, you know, um, a torrent of online abuse by internet trolls. Yeah. It's like 50,000 trolls, you know, that's a lot of trolls. You might start thinking maybe they're not all trolls. It was the beginning of the attempt to twist the story around so that the story became um, Kathy Newman, poor, embattled Channel 4 newscaster. When the Guardian story broke, I tweeted something. If you're threatening her, well, stop. Here's the terrible thing about it. You know, what happened was that the fact that I tweeted that was instantly used as validation for the claim that there were threats. And that, that just floored me. Like, I was very distraught, I think is the right word about that. She did this by manipulating your identity. It's very seductive to play the hero. You allowed them to smear your followers as harmful, harmful to women, harmful to Kathy Newman. That's why they were able to reassert their threat narrative, first against your followers, and then by transitive property against you in the aftermath of, their, of your interview. But to be honest, I can tell you regret that, so I'm not going to belabor this point at all. The real takeaway is this. The sheer amount of vitriol and narrative twister the press was playing after your interview proves how powerful what you did was. They couldn't let it stand, and what they did to try to erase it has, is never more transparent. At the end of the day, you won. You won, Professor Peterson. You showed the young men who followed you how to successfully fight back against a woman like Kathy Newman and her attempt to dominate your identity by painting you as harmful to women. You demonstrated to them how to pick up and wield the shield of men's issues and the sword of your own vulnerability, not to simply defeat Kathy Newman, it wasn't as simple as that at all, but to break her out of the threat narrative compulsion that gripped her and make her see you as a human being, to tear that tower down. You have demonstrated how to fight back, 
how to hold up Odysseus' mirror to cleanse Penelope of her madness, or if you prefer, using Perseus' shield to deflect the gaze of Medusa. And this fight is bigger than just young men, and the fact many of them never hear an encouraging word in their entire lives. There's a reasonable possibility that things are going to go very wrong very soon. For whom? For all of us. Our institutions of so-called truth are using language to dominate. They're using language itself to dominate, not to express ideas, to exchange observations and insight, or even to express vulnerability, just as a tool of dominance. This cancer of using language as a tool of dominance has already gutted our institutions of reason. It's turned colleges into factories for dogma. It's infected our institutions of law. Due process is the essence of rule of law, and they're deconstructing it. Threat narratives have infected everything we rely upon to maintain our complex society. This is unsustainable. Language, by its very essence, is a tool of mutual benefit and trust. If you change it to a tool of dominance, you will destroy it. This is beyond them taking over our government and economy to turn us into Marxists. This can't be a conspiracy by Marxist forces because its end goal is the death, is apparently the death of language itself. What possible political interest could want the death of language? And by extension, the destruction of all human civilization. Do cultural Marxists really want to go back to pre-verbal Stone Age society? Because if they do, we're all victims of their stupidity rather than their cunning. No, this has all the hallmarks of a train jumped its tracks and hurtling towards a cliff with no one at the controls. It's not coming out of any kind of political dogma. The problem is in the dynamic between men and women. That's why this cancer is everywhere and getting worse. And to wrestle out control to wrestle control back over the threat narrative. The battlefield will not be academia. It will not be media. It will not be government. It will be one young mind at a time. One young woman inoculated against becoming a cipher for a threat narrative like Kathy Newman, having her humanity crushed so she can learn to bark out her victimhood on command. And you vaccinate young women by recognizing their adult agency and responsibility, building blocks of her individuality, just like you demonstrated with Kathy Newman. In that moment, the Kathy Newman, the real Kathy Newman won over the cipher. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to work that out. I mean, Ha, gotcha. You have got me. And you do it one young man at a time, inoculated against having his identity dominated by a threat narrative, by giving him the sword and shield, men's issues, and owning his own vulnerability to go toe to toe with the Kathy Newmans of the world, just like you did. That sword and shield may be the greatest weight he'll ever carry, but with it, he can challenge the grip threat narratives have over our society. And the market is dominated by men. No, it's so not. It's you, not. The market is dominated by women. They make 80% of the consumer decisions. In my follow-up to Professor Peterson, cultural Marxism is not the problem. I used another example of a man using his vulnerabilities to save. Jesus. To, em to embrace public suffering and vulnerability, to say, I suffer to purify the world of sin. And let's add Mary, Mother Mary, the story of Mother Mary to that, to know how you will suffer and still agree to take up a great responsibility for the benefit of all. Maybe this moment is what those stories were for. Try it for good now. Um, hi, welcome to the end of the video. 
If you enjoyed this content and you'd like to support us in creating more, please go to www.patreon.com. Patrons get extra patron benefits, like previews of upcoming attractions. Right now, patrons have access to the first installment of my Deprogramming Women series, where I go through archaeology, history, psychology, linguistics, anthropology, and I explain exactly what's gone wrong with society and how we could potentially fix it. Well, maybe not fix it, but at least define the problem in such a way that the fix might come out of defining the problem. Anyway, if you're interested in something like that, that's a part of the patron-only previews on our, on our Patreon. It's also accessible through our Discord, where you can enjoy hanging out with us, with myself and the other Badgers. And once again, that's www.patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. And if you need another option, www.feedthebadger.com. Thank you. And I think I didn't fuck up. So this will probably be the take we use. I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>